The Girl Can't Help It came out in 56. I was only 10 years old then. But I have a memory of seeing it. I, I think it came to my local theater, the Telson Movie Theater. And there was a lot of rock and roll movies then, but this was the Hollywood one. This was the big time one. The other ones were like Tommy Sands made a movie, Sing, Boy Sing, and all those Alan Freed movies. And I was obsessed by rock and roll. When I was eight, I had a stage and I pretended I was Elvis Presley all day. And my parents, I was the first downloader because I made my parents buy me a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and then I would call up and tape the songs. I remember even then the disc jockey said, well, that's not a very nice thing to do. And then I didn't even understand why he would be upset about it. So I had the record, The Girl Can't Help It. That's where it came from, really, because Little Richard, it was the flip side or something of a, of a bigger hit or something. It wasn't Little Richard's big hit, but it made me crazy, right, the first time I ever heard it. And Jane Mansfield was always, I liked her better than Marilyn. I still do. Um, in my world, Jane Mansfield is the ultimate movie star. And even with Divine, uh, Divine was my Jane Mansfield only put together with Godzilla. We sort of put them together. So Jane Mansfield to me, still, I marvel at how she looks. She must have done the roots for her hair every day. She never had a root, not even like for one second we could see it. I firmly believe that she touched up her roots every day. And anyone that has a bar that is open eight hours a day in their house for the press, which she did have, <laughs> is a girl after my own heart. So I guess I saw it when I was about 12, it, because by the time it came out then, a movie could last in the theaters or for a video or anything. So I saw it, and I remember being stupefied by it because of, I remember the Julie London thing where she would appear like a ghost, like a hallucination. I remember I loved Gene Vincent, but I never had seen him before, really, as a kid. And he was scary then. He was scarier than Elvis or any of them. In real life, I think he was scarier. But if you look at that take, the guy, the close-up of the guy in the background of the band chewing gum and trying to be a du juvenile delinquent, he's my favorite. That's maybe my favorite shot in the whole movie. And I hated it when they would cut away to the plot. It really made me, man, I want to see that song. And you can tell they do cut away from him for a while. Even he might have been too much for the head office. You know, I can picture those notes saying, cut away from that ugly hillbilly. You know, I, I can imagine them saying that. Because they didn't even pick matinee idol good looks. I mean, none of the people in there were the kind of looks like they didn't pick, I don't know, Frankie Avalon. Well, he was later, but still, Fab well, Fabian was later too, but, but they looked scary. They were rockabilly. They weren't even just regular rock and roll. They were Southern, and they were scared people. They were like great rednecks that sang like black people. And, and that then, especially in 1956, was juvenile delinquency and all that was a big deal. People hated rock and roll. My parents hated rock and roll, period. This is beyond Elvis, worse. But to put it so slick in this Hollywood lighting and everything, that's what made it cartoonish and almost freakish. The only thing that struck me weird even as a child, and today that's really weird, there were never nightclubs that had rock and roll like that. It was like a Busby Berkeley musical in a way. Where, the, where you would see these acts, believe me, Little Richard never sang The Girl Can't Help It in a fancy nightclub where women had on furs and everything. I saw them when I was 16, like Ike and Tina Turner, and they came in a green school bus, and she had a mustache and wore a ratty wig. You know, the, the early days of rhythm and blues were hardly in the stork club, which is what this was like. Ready, set, go, man, go. I got a gal that I love, so I'm ready. Richard is beyond what you could ever hope for. You can tell little Richard is calmed down there or something. They've calmed him down some because he almost looks like he's looking off stage for direction as he's singing. You, he seems a little ill at ease, but he never looked more beautiful. I mean, he looks amazing playing that piano. And obviously, I wanted to be little Richard. I mean, the mustache was from him even though in The Girl Can't Help It, there are two mustaches like mine. The close-up of the guy all the way on the left in the platters has the mustache, too. You'll never know. No, no, I know I won't reveal the way I really, truly feel. Little Richard had the same appeal to white kids as rap music does today. Your white parents were horrified that there was the black man screaming up in your bedroom, Lucille! 
And I remember my grandmother laughing so hard at Lucille, she couldn't believe that, you know, I was singing the song. All early rock and roll was black people singing and white people, the cool white kids loving it and the less cool white kids listening to the cover when the white groups would do it. This movie has it backwards. It has the black maid watching a white singer while she dances. I thought that was cheeky. Won't you come on over, honey? I'm all alone. I said, Betty, you're mighty sweet. But I'm in bed with the ache and feet. This went on for a couple of days. Oh, because that's the exact opposite of what happened. It's really what happened, I remember, is I hung around with the black maid and we talked about Little Richard. <laughs> My parents certainly weren't watching rock and roll with the maid. <laughs> it, that didn't happen. That jumped out to me as being the exact, a real, a cover of real life. What they call the mo can't help it, the girl can't help it, the girl can't help it, she won't the police. The best entire thing in the movie is when the ice melts and <laughs> the milk bottles pop, which was really rude for the 50s then. I mean, that's very much a cum shot. I mean, that is a semen joke and a lactating joke when she's got the two milk bottles. So the movie was kind of racy, I think, for the time. Only it had humor. I make fun of pop culture, but I really love pop culture, and I believe Tashin loved it too. Um, I don't think you can work with Jerry Lewis all those times and Jane Mansfield and not love, unless you're a masochist, really. Uh, it wasn't like he was trapped before making slow art movies in Sweden and suddenly came to Hollywood. But there's also moments in this film that remind me of Douglas Sirk. Maybe you and I can have Thanksgiving dinner together, Mr. Miller. Maybe we can, Georgie. Good night, Georgie. <laughs> it really looks like Cirque. And, and I think, oddly enough, while Cirque is known for great melodrama and this incredibly beautiful irony and lighting, there are similarities to it, um, in a way of visual similarities. Well, that's funny. He understood irony. It was an early ironic movie. I mean, certainly, we are the only country. I mean, you can, in Albania, is anything so bad it's good? Is there camp if you're poor? No, it's, it's a rich person's taste um, because it's irony. Um, the same way that my movies did terribly in real exploitation theaters because they smell a rat, me, because I'm making fun of the genre. And Frank Tashin, I never felt was making fun of the rock and roll movie. He's making a little bit of fun of rock and roll and how you can be a star overnight and that kind of thing. And you need a gimmick and all that. Shut my cell and lock me in. Never let me out again. When I hear the siren blow. I get those rock, rock. I think for comedy in each decade, you have to have an exaggerated style to change it, for you to take the title, for you to influence, for us to be sitting here how many years later and going back and talking about it. Yeah, you have to be extreme. You have to go over the top and you have to change things a little by being radical in a certain way. And I think Frank Tashin was. Come in. He saw the extreme taste. He had leopard in there. He had in Jane Mansfield's dressing room. I mean, he understood that. And he understood how beautiful bad taste could be. It did. The color in that movie is, you could try my whole life, I could never get a movie to look that beautiful. Um, those, those glittery curtains behind everybody, oh my God, I wish I had had them as a child. My parents did build me a stage as a child, but I didn't have glittery curtains. I gave them to Dawn Davenport in Female Trouble when they make a stage for her, she had Girl Can't Help It curtains. Spread the word, spread the gospel, let the congregation know that a cornet was the downfall of the walls of Jericho. Spread the word, spread the gospel, speak the truth, it will be heard till the next revival meeting. Spread
Spread the gospel, spread the word. To me, the color in that movie, the technicolor in that movie, is it never has it looked more what I'm jealous of. I mean, that is how movies should look, how that looks. And, and, and the jokes about the technicolor, certainly in the beginning, when he opens up the screen. Well, I did a joke like that in Polyester where he says, ladies and gentlemen, this is Odorama instead of Technicolor. And the screen just gets a tiny bit bigger, just goes like that. That was, few people got that joke. Gorgeous, lifelike color by Deluxe. Okay, it's Deluxe color, and not Technicolor. All right, well, Deluxe color then, I apologize because you look better than Technicolor. Deluxe color, what happened to Deluxe color? I want it today. Because whatever that film stock was, whatever that camera was, and whatever especially the lighting was and everything, it, to me, symbolized what I all, wish all my movies could look like. Garish, beautiful. I love rear projection. It had great bad rear projection. I love when they went to the beach and you could see like it was a blue screen, just a screen they were sitting in front of. But what kind of car was that? Was it an Imperial she was driving? I bet it was. I couldn't tell. It was a Chrysler Corporation car, I think. I think it was an Imperial and they were really good. They were better than Cadillacs. They were trashier and nouveau richer. Picnic. Picnic? It's a surprise. I'll give you lunch. Won't Fats be surprised? He's expecting us. I picked you up an hour early. We have lots of time. You get the basket, I'll undress. Undress? Uh, uh, Jerry, now wait a minute. This was definitely a broad comedy. But I, I don't think it seems so out of place more than any other movie. I think what's what's so radical is is the color and the costumes and, and, and the extreme looking people filmed in a very Hollywood way where you're used to seeing Hollywood movies about people that are your ideal in looks or, or a movie star what everybody wish they look like. Few wish they look like Jane Mansfield. I mean, some of my friends wish that they look like Jane Mansfield, but they're mental institutions. <laughs> I mean, I mean, Jane was hardly every day. But people like Jane, I think. I think she was a comedian. People felt, she's not Anna Nicole Smith, but in a, because she was smarter than Anna Nicole Smith, I think. I, I think Jane was smart. Remember she played the violin with Jack Benny? She was, um, she played the violin and she could play the violin. And, and she did a lot of smart things. She worked with George, Ax, George Axelrod, you know, she did some, she was hardly slumming. She was a big star. And um, she could act stupid, but I don't think she was stupid at all in real life. She, she was a parody of a dumb blonde, certainly. She was a parody of Marilyn Monroe. She went beyond parody. She was an insane Marilyn Monroe. She got it. Oh, baby, she got it. Woo baby, she got it. I can't do it I think this is cartoonish in the best possible way. Jane Mansfield is an animated character. She's n not a real person. She's, an, she's a, from out of space, basically. I mean, look at her. I mean, I mean, she is a piece of work. And when I grew up, there was a television show in Baltimore called This Is Your Zoo. And the mascot of it was Babs the monkey. And they dressed her like Jane Mansfield. And I think of Jane Mansfield as Babs the monkey now, like a glamour girl monkey. They put on like a tight dress and everything. And it was because of Jane Mansfield. And, and I never got over Jane Mansfield. I, I still think that's how women should look, basically. <laughs> I'm not much for the natural look. Jane tried, you know, and she really spent a lot of time in her appearance. And she looked to me like she was really happy being completely out of her mind, like an extreme glamour person. Well, that's certainly the irony of it, that I think Jane probably did want a normal life. She had kids. I think she was a pretty good mother, too. I mean, sometimes. Uh, if you read all the books, The Tragic Secret Life of Jane Mansfield is the best. Supposedly, she took LSD at the end. Imagine her hallucinations. <laughs> but um, I, I don't know. I always thought she was a nice person. I do. And, and I feel bad that she's buried in, in Pittsburgh or wherever, Pennsylvania somewhere. She really needs to be in Hollywood. Big Breasted Woman in the 50s was an obsession. It is worse now. They didn't have silicone then. 
look at it now. I mean, I have a character in my new movie, Selma Blair, where she has breasts bigger than her head, and she's locked in her parents' room because it's her holding area because the parents don't want her to ever go out and be seen by the neighbors. Um, big breasts are still... There are freaks that love it. I mean, in the 50s, it seemed like everyone liked it. Now it's more of a fetish. They have specialized videos for people that like women with breasts bigger than her head. In the 50s, it seemed everyone liked women with breasts bigger than their heads. Jane Mansfield has always looked a little like a drag queen, but no drag queen can pull it off like Jane could, really. I mean, it, because she's in on it. That's the thing that makes it so endearing. You never, when you said that some critics said that it was pitiful, I, I radically disagree with that. Because um, how can you be pitiful if you're in on the joke? Ask my agent. Oh, what do you do? Uh, sing? Dance? Ask my agent. Oh, <laughs> the lady's a comedian, eh? Well, she's certainly down in cinema history. And I don't think as a joke. I, I, I think basically as extreme. Uh, she sums up the 50s. I mean, you think about the 50s, no more, nobody's more extreme than Jane Mansfield in representing what a 50s glamour girl gone berserk, really. Beyond glamour, like nuts. Acid. I always loved Little Richard, as I said, from the very beginning when I, I shoplifted his records when I was young. I later paid 30000 each to put him in a movie, so I don't feel guilty. But um, I finally met him, and Playboy asked me who I'd like to interview, and so I said I'd like to interview Little Richard. So I went to Little Richard, where he lived at the Sunset Marquee, which he may still live, as far as I know. And I had just read his book. He has an amazing autobiography that's out where he talks about being a drag queen in the, in the carnival, about how he used to send people bowel movements gift-wrapped. And we had already done this in Pink Flamingos. This was afterwards. I thought, someone else did that? And, uh, so I love this book. And it was he was talking about, like, he just liked to watch all the time. And he would hang around with black strippers, and they would get the rhythm and blues stars, and he'd look at their penis, all this kind of stuff. So, of course, I asked him about that. And he flipped out and said, like, I can't talk about this. What are my religious people that read Jet Magazine? I said, I read Jet Magazine, too. And he said, I can't talk about this. I said, well, Richard, you just wrote this book, and I'm from Playboy. What do you think I'm going to ask you about? Well, you can't take this tape from the room. And I said, well, you want to bet here? You know, and he had a bodyguard I could have beaten up that was sitting there. I thought, well, I've never been in a fist fight in my life, but if I have to be, I can win this one. Right? So I took the tape, and he said he was going to flip out everything. And it, and we published the interview, and I think it came out well. And I've never seen him since. And I'm sad about that. I mean, like, maybe you should never meet your idols. That's my advice. If you really love somebody and everything, don't screw with it. <laughs> Let's just leave it alone. And I still was fascinated by him. And I think he's still alive. He's still working. He is had an amazing career. He still goes on the road. He still does it. He does commercials. And he's, he's become... Jane Mansfield, in a weird way, a parody of himself, and in a great way. What else could he do? I mean, what he looks like, that hairdo he had in the beginning. Jerry Lee Lewis even copied it, you know, but Jerry Lee Lewis could be like that and it would fall all the way down. <laughs> Little Richards wouldn't go all the way down. But Little Richards outfits and his clothes and his full makeup that he wore at the time, he was really ahead of his time. I mean, he was the gorgeous George of um, rock and roll and gorgeous George was the, was the phony gay wrestler at the time that came out in the 50s that was kind of the most shocking thing you could do, be girlish. So Little Richard really shocked people. Not only was he black, not only was he screaming Lucille up in your white kid's bedroom, he was practically a drag queen. <laughs> and it really confused parents. It never confused kids. He was a showman. They loved him. They didn't care. I don't remember anybody being uptight about Little Richard's sexuality during all the 50s. I never heard anything about it. And you look at the pictures and think, wonder why nobody said anything. I mean, it seemed like he was, you know, pretty much of not only... He was a queen in the best sense of the word. He was the king of rock and roll and the queen of rock and roll. Vincent Perenio, whose production design all my movies, grew up, we, he loves The Girl Can't Help It. We all watch The Girl Can't Help It. Um, lots. I mean, Jane Mansfield, Divine used to watch it all the time. Um, we all 
that was, a, you know, one of our top ten movies. It was something that we all watched, you know, every year, like, families watch The Wizard of Oz. It was, it was basically a big influence on everybody, certainly. And you can see it, those colored curtains. I mean, I was looking at it today, and even the credits with the Jitterbug couple, I realized the choreographer for Crybaby saw that and used some of it. I didn't even realize that till today. Some of the same steps are in Crybaby. It, it literally defines what 50s movies were. The girl can't help it. The chuckles. What happened to the chuckles? You know, you should find them. <laughs> or the chuckles' children.